Chapters 1 and 2 of The Haunted House on Duchess Street. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gerard Street Mystery and Other Weird Tales by John Charles Dent. The Haunted House on Duchess Street. Being a narration of certain strange events alleged to have taken place at York, Upper Canada, in or about the year 1823. O'er all there hung the shadow of a fear, a sense of mystery the spirit daunted, and said, as plain as whisper in the ear, the place is haunted. Hood. Chapter 1. Outside the House. I suppose there are at least a score of persons living in Toronto at the present moment who remember that queer old house on Duchess Street. Not that there was anything specially remarkable about the house itself, which, indeed, in its best days, presented an aspect of rather snug respectability. But the events I am about to relate invested it with an evil reputation, and made it an object to be contemplated at a safe distance, rather than from any near approach. Youngsters on their way to school were wont to eye it askance as they hurried by on their way to their daily tasks. Even children of a larger growth manifested no unbecoming desire to penetrate too curiously into its inner mysteries and for years its threshold was seldom or never crossed by anybody except Simon Washburn or some of his clerks, who about once in every twelfth month made a quiet entry upon the premises and placed in the front windows announcements to the effect that the place was for sale or to let. The printing of these announcements involved a useless expenditure of capital, for, from the time when the character of the house became matter of notoriety, no one could be induced to try the experiment of living in it, in the case of a house, no less than in that of an individual, a bad name is more easily gained than lost, and in the case of the house on Duchess Street, its uncanny repute clung to it with a persistent grasp, which time did nothing to relax. It was distinctly and emphatically a place to keep away from. The house was originally built by one of the Redoubt family, I think by the Surveyor General himself, soon after the close of the War of 1812, and it remained intact until a year or two after the town of York became the city of Toronto, when it was partly demolished and converted into a more profitable investment. The new structure, which was a shingle or stave factory, was burned down in 1843 or 1844, and the site thenceforward remained unoccupied until comparatively recent times. When I visited the spot a few weeks since, I encountered not a little difficulty in fixing upon the exact site, which is covered by an unprepossessing row of dark red brick, presenting the aspect of having stood there from time immemorial, though, as I am informed, the houses have been erected within the last quarter of a century. Unattractive as they appear, however, they are the least uninviting feature in the landscape, which is prosaic and squalid beyond description. Rickety, tumble-down tenements of dilapidated lath and plaster stare the beholder in the face at every turn. During the greater part of the day the solitude of the neighborhood remains unbroken, save by the tread of some chance wayfarer like myself, and a general atmosphere of the abomination of desolation reigns supreme. Passing along the unfrequented pavement, one finds it difficult to realize the fact that this was once a not unfashionable quarter of the capital of Upper Canada. The old house stood forty or fifty feet back from the roadway, on the north side, overlooking the waters of the bay. The lot was divided from the street by a low picket fence, and admission to the enclosure was gained by means of a small gate. In those remote times there were few buildings intervening between Duchess Street and the waterfront, and those few were not very pretentious. So when the atmosphere was free from fog, you could trace from the windows of the upper story the entire hithermost shore of the peninsula, which has since become the island. The structure itself, like most buildings then erected in York, was of frame, it was of considerable dimensions for those days, and must have contained at least eight or nine rooms. It was two stories high, and had a good deal of painted fretwork about the windows of the upper story. A stately elm stood immediately in the rear, and its wide-spreading branches overshadowed the greater part of the back yard and outbuildings. And that is all I have been able to learn about the exterior aspect of the place. Chapter 2. Inside the House A small porch door, about halfway down the western side, furnished the ordinary mode of entrance to and exit from the house. This door opened into an apartment which served the double purpose of sitting-room and dining-room, and which was connected by an inner door with the kitchen and back premises. There was, however, a rather wide-mouthed front entrance, approached by a short flight of wooden steps, 
and opening into a fair-sized hall. To the right of the hall, as you entered, a door opened into what served as a drawing-room, which was seldom used, as the occupants of the house were not given to receiving much fashionable company. To the left of the hall, another door opened into the dining-room already mentioned. A stairway facing the front entrance conducted you to the upper story, which consisted of several bedrooms and a large apartment in front. This latter must have been by long odds the pleasantest room in the house. It was of comfortable dimensions, well-lighted, and cheerful as to its outlook. Two front windows commanded a prospect of the bay and the peninsula, while a third window on the eastern side overlooked the valley of the Don, which was by no means the stagnant pool which it was destined to become in later years. The only entrance to this chamber was a door placed directly to the right hand at the head of the stairway, which stairway, it may be mentioned, consisted of exactly seventeen steps. A small bedroom in the rear was accessible only by a separate door at the back of the upper hallway, and was thus not directly connected with the larger apartment. I am not informed as to the precise number and features of the other rooms in the upper story, except that is they were bedrooms, nor is any further information respecting them essential to a full comprehension of the narrative. Why I have been so precise as to what may at first appear trivial details will hereafter appear. End of chapter 2